Ladies and gentlemen, Alan Underwood. Hello. That's going to be really hard to follow up by Rios. That's, uh, that was a lot of demos. So um, I don't have that much. Uh, basically, what I'm here to talk about, we'll get into here in a second. My name's Alan Underwood. I do a podcast. My buddy's here. We, we co-host a podcast together, codingblocks.net. In our opinion, the best coding podcast there is. So if you haven't had a chance, check it out. We talk about design patterns, all kinds of stuff. Uh, I work for a company called Bay Dynamics. We write security-based software. Um, I'm a full stack guy. I do C Sharp, SQL Server, JavaScript. I tinker around with everything. So this was just kind of fun. Um, it, and we'll go ahead and get started and talk about what is serverless, what I mean. It's kind of a buzzword. So the first thing, it's kind of a buzzkill. There is a server. It, nothing's really serverless, right? They all have something that's running the code. Otherwise, it would be useless. But I kind of like to compare it to versus owning a home or something. This is almost like going to a hotel and renting a hotel. So when you're in serverless mode, you've got someone who comes in and prepares your room. Like you don't have to set it up. You don't have to clean it every day. That's all done for you. Same thing in the serverless world. They're managing all your hardware for you. They're managing your OS updates, all that kind of stuff. So you don't have to worry about it. So your patches, the facilities, if a, if a pipe breaks in the room, they're going to take care of it. You don't have to worry about it. All the security stuff is taken care of for you. You only pay for what you use when you pull out of that mini bar. If you go and drink everything in that mini bar, you're going to get a big bill. Same type thing in the serverless thing. When you start talking about the way that you use these things, you're only getting charged for the time and the processing that you utilize as opposed to going out in typical fashion and buying a server and setting it up and running your code. Um, some rooms have a scale. With serverless, you can scale. Like It's kind of handled for you. You don't have to worry about those things. And I don't know if any rooms actually have a scale. I made that up. Oh. And so with room service, you can call, you can have it done on the TV, you can do it through an app. In this way, what's really cool about serverless architecture is you can have all kinds of things that trigger what will run your code. It could be a database, it could be a queue, it could be an event hub, it could be all kinds of things that do it, just a simple HTTP trigger. So it's really neat stuff. So what's available? It, there's actually a lot out here, but I'm going with the big three. So Microsoft Azure. They have their own thing. And one of the cool things about Azure is they support a ton of different languages. You have AWS Lambda, obviously super popular. They have Java Node, Node.js, C Sharp, and Python. And then you've got Google, which interestingly enough went Node.js only. So like Riaz said, like everybody's supporting JavaScript, but you can see there's only a handful of other things supported across the board. So which do you pick? This is one of the things that's always tough, right? What do you need? Well, we're talking about JavaScript today, so you can go with any of them. If you're already in AWS or you're already in Azure, any of those kind of things, pick whichever you're comfortable with where you've already got things running. And then the pricing might have been an issue at some point, but like literally they're all driving each other down now. So you know, go with whatever best suits your needs. So in order to think in this, this you know, serverless thing, what do you need to do? You need to think stateless. You can't have things that, that build up a session that you're doing. These things need to be able to run on their own. And if you don't know what idempotent is, it's basically, it's a mathematical term. Anytime you run something, you should get the same result each time. And so this little thing is very true. It, you know, no matter how many times you tell it, it's going to be funny. So they should be lightweight and fast. You don't want something, somebody said, don't let it block a thread. You need to be doing things that run quickly, and it, maybe it's not the fastest thing in the world, but you want to be trying to think about how you can break down your problem. You need to utilize queues. If you're, if you're trying to deal with cross-function running to where you're processing pieces of data and something else needs to pick it up, use queues. Use some other type of storage. Don't try and pass things back and forth because you really need to minimize that time. And one of the things that is probably the most difficult thing to do if you've ever dealt with microservices or anything like that is you have to develop defensively. You have to expect that there's going to be network breakdowns, there's going to be problems that come up that you probably didn't anticipate. So when that function runs again, you need it to be able to check to make sure that it's not going to do something bad. So you'll probably have a lot more checks and balances in place for that code that runs. And so really the, what got me to want to even talk about this is so on our podcast, one of the things that, that Michael does a lot is he'll go in there every time that we release an episode and we try and track our, our numbers after each release so that, so that if we get contact by, contacted by advertisers, we can say, okay, well, we've gotten this many downloads, whatever. And it's really kind of a pain. And a lot of the, a lot of the podcast platform tooling out there 
doesn't make it easy for you to get statistics out of there. And so one of the things I thought about is for me, I'm always like, well, I could always put this on a server and I could run this and I could do this. And it just really becomes kind of overcomplicated and a little frustrating. So what I decided to do was, all right, well, let me test this using a serverless setup. So much like Riaz, I am not very smart, so I am going to try and do a little live demo here. And I'm going to show you Azure. Um, AWS has similar setups. They're all somewhat convoluted, like nothing super easy to do, but hopefully walking through this, you'll see that it's not really all that intimidating. And the cool part is, like I said, monetarily, like this stuff doesn't cost a lot. You pay sort of for what you're using space-wise, which typically if you're writing a function, isn't a lot of space. And then you're only paying for when this thing runs. And the cool part is when I said that it scales out, if you all of a sudden need to call this thing a thousand times and that one particular server can't handle that load, they'll scale it for you. You don't have to create any kind of elastic beanstalk. You don't have to worry about this stuff. They do it all. So you're just paying for what you use and you don't have to worry about much else except for what credit card you got hooked up to it. Um, so really the whole idea is what you do is you come in and you create a resource group and for this we'll call it JS Meetup. And I'm gonna do it in the East US. And the part is, is some of this stuff doesn't make sense. If you think about the resource group, it's really just kind of like creating a folder that you're gonna use. And one of the things is they do everything asynchronously because that's what they wanna do and sometimes it's kind of a pain because you just gotta keep refreshing until you get what you want. But after you do that, you're gonna come over here and another thing that's not intuitive, they have their own website that is Azure dot my, or actually it's appjs.azure.microsoft.com or something. If you just come in here and you search for um, function app, then you'll be able to create it this way. And so you come in here, you set this thing up. And one of the interesting things here is when you go about it this way, you can actually go and set up your own storage first because you have to have a place to store your files. You have to set up like what your service tier is going to be. If you do all that separately, you can more fine tune things. When you do it this way, it kind of creates like the most baseline thing, so it's the cheapest. I set this up the other day and I set like a pretty high service tier and I ended up getting charged five bucks just for having it replicated across the world. So I'm never gonna use it across the world, but you know, learning experience. So at any rate, the consumption plan, this is where if you choose that, that's what will auto scale for you. They have something interesting in Azure that I don't know that is in AWS, but if you have VMs already set up in Azure, you can tell it, hey, use that VM CPU as opposed to spinning up another process to run out there. So it's kind of a way to utilize something that you're already running and not get charged anymore for it. So it's interesting to know about. And we'll put this in the East US because that's where we are. The storage account, this is gonna create something that's just backed up locally. So again, this is way cheaper than the way that I did it the other day. Oh, I guess you need to put a name. So we'll put that in there, create this thing. And here in just a second, we'll see something that's actually interesting other than getting in here. But the funny part is before I knew how to do this, it took me like 30 minutes to figure out how to set up a function app because it's just not intuitive. Um, and some of them have that same problem. AWS was actually easier to set up in my opinion, but there were some things about it that weren't quite as nice. So um, let's get here to the resource group. And so we should see my function over here. Well, that's the storage, so it's still spinning up the rest of it, which is, like I said, kind of interesting. It does all this thing asynchronously, and there it is. So if we click in here and look at it, one of the nice things about a lot of these services now is you kind of get these online consoles and these online editors that you can do. And if you really just wanted to start vanilla, you could click one of these things right here, and it will generate all that for you. I'm going to go to the new function area because it gives you a lot more options. Basically the same thing you saw except in less wizardy format, but you go to JavaScript and let's say that I want to use regular API and webhooks and you get these ones that are available. And I just want an HTTP trigger. I want to be able to call this thing from a browser so that I can get the data back. Again, you could have a generic webhook, so think Slack or something like that. If you want to create some sort of implementation that's, that's interacting with Slack, you can do that. Uh, they have them for GitHub. There's all kinds of things you can do. Like I said, event hubs, uh, buses, you can look at document DB, you can look at SQL Server, all kinds of different ways that you could do this stuff. You can even set up timers to fire this thing off all the time. So I'm going to do this one and I'm just gonna name it that. Don't worry about it too much. <clears throat> 
And here's what it does. It automatically creates your boilerplate code for having this thing. And so if I were to call this right now, and I run this, oh, I'm supposed to put something in there, of course. I probably should have shown my code first. Oh, come on. Man, I don't know why, but Chrome on my Mac does not like it sometimes. Man. <laughs> Safari something. Let me let me close that. It, Chrome for some reason just dies with the video card sometimes. So what I'll do is fairly quickly is I'll get in here and show you some code on what I actually did. So let's go to that, uh, what I've already got set up so that you can see this. And basically, all I did, and unfortunately, where we host our podcast is called Libsyn. And they give you some stats, but it's kind of a pain to extract all that information. So um, at the risk of making Outlaw go crazy because he really doesn't like sharing this stuff, uh, what I'll show you is the code that we go and get this. And it's really, it's just like he said earlier, you look at this stuff and it's really nothing all that special. So you've got your package.json, which if you've done any Node.js programming, like all I'm doing here is I'm pulling in a few dependencies, right? So I have Bluebird and I have request and I have request debug. Nothing special, uh, it's just what you've always seen before. And here is my actual application. And I don't know, let's see if you can see that well. So. Basically, this one's dirty. They have no APIs you can call. And this is why it's kind of a pain to get out, is you have to navigate to a page, say, download this information. And so you could literally go to a bunch of different pages, download stuff every day. Instead of that, I basically wrote like a little screen scraper that'll go in and pull this stuff. So I, I'm doing everything asynchronously. So at the very bottom, it's really pretty, right? Like I tell it, hey, go get the download data, do a log out first, then log in. Um, go get the episode list, populate the episode collection, and so on. And so it's a very linear type thing, but it's all done asynchronously so that hopefully I'm not blocking the thread. But the beauty here is we have, we have stats that come from Libsyn. We're also going to be on other things like SoundCloud. We have other places that we put them, like we have YouTube numbers. And, and eventually it's going to be just an absolute royal pain to get. But the cool part is what I've got here is... I can go log in with this stuff, and then I have this process.environment, get the Libsyn show ID. And so literally, I put this thing up in the cloud. When I run this thing, you can set up your environment variables um, behind the scenes. Uh, the thing's gone. Oh, it's because I did this. So you've got, I'll show you here in a second, you can go over here and you can manage, but you can set up your environment variables so you don't have your passwords and all that stuff out there right, in your code. And this stuff can all be driven from GitHub as well. So you could actually put your app up in GitHub and have it deploy out here and run for you in the cloud. So if you need to make a change, you can actually have it go through a build pipeline, put it out here in Azure, and you don't have to worry about anything. So pretty much, this is just your standard stuff, right? Like I'm going out, I get, I get all the information to go aggregate all the data and then bring it back. And I mean, really, it's fairly simple. So if I assuming this doesn't die on the video again. I also use Postman because it's amazing. And what I'll do is I will grab the function URL here. And mine's, I, I don't know that I would call it super lightweight, but if I run this right now, basically it's going to go out and do exactly what I was saying. It's asynchronously grabbing all the data for every single episode that we have out there, and I bring it back and put it together in a way that'll make sense so that we could actually auto-populate that stuff and put it into spreadsheets and all that. But the cool part is, the only amount that I'm gonna get charged for this is while I'm running it right now. This thing will be sitting out there and won't get run for another day or two. There's gonna be no charges except a few pennies for having the, the files hosted on there. And if we ever decided to scale this thing up to where we had forms that were auto-populating Excel sheets or whatever that we could give to potential advertisers, then it's only getting charged for when it's being used. So 
it's it's a pretty cool thing. Like if you've never actually toyed with this, it's a nice way to be able to leverage scale and leverage not having to have your own server and all that stuff set up and still be able to get work done for relatively cheap, actually. I mean, uh, when I was doing this prior to my screw up the other day, I think I had been charged like 50 cents and I'd run it, I don't know, 20 times. So um, it's pretty amazing. Like I said, mine's not super lightweight, but yeah, there's a ton of data that came here. And so literally this is all our episode data for all time. You can see how tiny this scroll bar is over here. But basically I could take this stuff, aggregate it, put it into something that would actually generate, you know, these are what our stats are. We can do our six week numbers, we can do whatever. So um, just a little taste of what it is as far as what the serverless thing is. What I'm showing is aggregating data, getting things from other places, but you could literally do whatever you want. You could have things triggered based off a of time of day. You could have things triggered off, you know, if you had some IoT device and you clicked a button, you could literally hook it up to an event hub and have it go update something for you. So um, tons and tons of uses for it. And that's, that's pretty much what I got, so. Say again? Oh, that's what it was. So if you add it from there, it does something weird too. That, I guess that's my frustration with a lot of these things is depending on where you add things from, it does things for you that you're not exactly aware of. So just know that if you're going to do something like that, you kind of got to pay attention. Because like I said, I, you know, if I hadn't been paying attention to it, I could easily burn up 50 bucks in a week and not even known it, right? So. So on the free tiers, I'm not aware of any that actually do free tiers for the functions or for, or for the Lambda architecture, the serverless stuff. Uh, all of them do offer the first month, you know, free type thing, like up to $200 for Azure. And I don't remember what AWS is or any of that. Um, so I don't think they do that. Now, as far as the ease of setup, I actually found Azure's to be pretty straightforward after I figured out that you have to search for the words function app. Lambda was super easy to set up, but um, I didn't get as far with that as I wanted. There were some nice things about AWS that I liked. So for instance, I, I'm not going to show you exactly what my keys were in here because I don't want you going and taking over my account. Uh, but there is, when you go in at the environment variables that I was talking about earlier, when you come into this, it's kind of nice because there's a place that you can go set up the things that you don't necessarily want to change and they actually have hooks for making it production ready so you can say I want this variable to persist across stage and production and all that. So those are pretty nice little things. Um, but if we come down here, oh actually down here, if you come down to the app settings there's a, there's a whole slew of things here. But really these are your environment variables right here. So like what I did is I came down here on the other one and I set up my keys, right? So I have my username, my password, all that kind of stuff. And it's completely abstracted away from your application. All you need to do is access the variables. Now, if I were to open up my real code and show you, you would see my username, password, all that stuff right here. The thing that I did like about AWS is they have theirs hooked up to their key value management system or their uh, their actual secure system. So you can actually hook in your username, password, and all that stuff and have it completely obfuscated and you know hidden from anybody being able to see. I hear that's a feature coming in Azure. I don't know when or if that's actually going to happen. Um, but the setup, I didn't get far enough with the, uh, the Lambda one to give you full feedback on that, but there was definitely more to it than, than the Azure one. Like this one was fairly easy, it, but both of them do offer, offer you the ability to basically take a template and say, hey, create me this thing and then go tinker with it and move forward. MSDN is not cheap though. <laughs> so yeah, it, so I, I've actually got $150 a month that I get for free for being a Microsoft MVP. Um, if you have an MSDN account, if you're a pro user, you get $50 a month, which is amazing. You can do a lot with $50 a month on these things. Um, I don't know about AWS. I don't know if they have any like continuing free tiers. Not with the first year. Uh, no, yeah, first year. Yeah, just, just a question about usage of this in the community. Uh, 
Um, you, you have this ongoing um, discussion with the office about what to do for the press. Uh, we are big on automation, two guys, and testing. Um, and I'm just trying, I'm just wondering if anybody who is just going to be sure a team environment, you have to integrate it with their, uh, with their um, in-team workflow. Anybody? Anybody? Well, you could hook it up to like VSTS, right? And hook it up into their build pipeline that you could have your, your integration test or your, or your build test. I mean, what's really interesting is if you're gonna leverage this on a team, you might go the route of like microservices because it really forces you to think in that stateless mode as opposed to having something rely on this, rely on that. You could set these things up similar to microservices and have those run. On your deployments though, you'd have to build up your own pipeline to, to do your testing. Although I think there is a test thing in here, and and again I didn't really mess with it because I was just trying to get my MVP out and and play with it a little bit. But um, I thought they did have something. I'm just not. I can't remember where I saw it now. Okay. Oh, check it out. Here's test. Oh, but this is just being able to test. This is kind of like a built-in Postman, so not not quite the same thing. Five users. VSTS, it's very scriptable. Yeah, you can do a ton of stuff. Like, it, it's funny because, uh, I mean, this is complete tangent to uh, JavaScript, but uh, a lot of people aren't even aware of VSTS. It, like, you can host your Git repos there, and they really have some nice tools. It, it's, I mean, it's the same. I think the reason why I went with, uh, with Azure on this one was because it's just really easy to kind of get started. Um, that's, that's about it. Like, AWS in the past, I've worked with it quite a bit, and it's... There are some things that are non-intuitive, right? Like you spend a lot of time just trying to figure out how to get things set up in a way that you can start working with them. But, you know, things might have changed. Any other questions? Yeah. So, I guess the name of this is, is uh, Azure Functions or something like that? Azure Functions. What is the name of the, the, of the, the storage part of it, I guess? So, the storage is actually just blob storage. So, similar to what they have in AWS for S3, they sort of provision a blob storage for you behind the scenes. And uh, as a matter of fact, so when you create any of this stuff, it's kind of interesting. If, if I click on the, the one that I just spun up a second ago, this JS Meetup, what you'll see over here are the three things that it's set up. So this is the service plan, and that one's like relatively cheap, but it's the one that also scale for you. And then this right here is your storage account. And really what's kind of nifty behind the scenes is, this creates your files and sets all that stuff up. You can actually go online in something that looks very similar to Visual Studio Code and edit your files in here. And it's, it's pretty awesome. But here you'll see, here's the files. And you basically get charged for the storage and that's pretty much what it boils down to. So here's your site. And I, I mean, it sets up a, a full on type thing for you that again, that you don't have to manage, but it's there. Uh, if I can get to it real quick, so these are the these are the files that I have over there. If I come over here to the one that's real, and I look at this in the app services, you literally get a full blown console. So let's see. Yeah, so if I open the dev console here, 
then you'll see that I can actually look through these directories just like it was something else that you know you're used to. You can come in here, you can touch files, you can do npm uh, installs, you can you know run a, a whole slew of things. Although again, npm init for some weird reason is not there. But if I say libsyn scraper or maybe I have to type the whole thing in. No, actually, if you do control space, it'll pick it up and let you do it. Tab won't do it for some reason, but at any rate, so you can come in here and you can do all kinds of things, and you can do npm, am I in here yet, npm install, and it will actually take your packages.json and run it. So you don't even have to hook up to this thing through a regular terminal. You can actually come in and do most of what you need here. Like when I did this one just to get familiar with it, I did not use Visual Studio because I wanted to show that I could do this without going through that. So basically, I coded up my, my little thing in, in Visual Studio Code, came up here and just ran the NPM install, and I was up and running. Um, so I got a warning because I don't have a description, like NPM yells at you, but basically that just did the whole thing and pulled it all down. So you've got access to a ton of tools, and this isn't even the console. There's one that looks very much like Visual Studio Code where you can literally click around on the files on the side and do all that. So. Yeah, totally. So here, I don't mind sharing my screw up. So I started off with 150 bucks, and again, I screwed around the other day and burnt five dollars, just not even realizing it. But you can get a full-on, you know, graph of where your costs break down. And I think it was storage, which is what shocked me. I was like, well, it had to be something because I wasn't really doing anything with it at the time, other than trying to get this set up. Um, but yeah, so if you look here, I had created something the other day. It was JS Meetup. That was $6, literally overnight, basically. Um, and that's because I had it replicated all over the world. Um, I mean, people want to see this. So, so, so um, but yeah, I mean, that's basically where it broke down. And if you look at this, you'll see that this was the cost by resource. It was the JS Meetup thing that I created the other day. And the burn rate, like, you know, it was going to happen pretty quick. Uh, so 4.2 to 4.9, maybe I'll let it run a little bit more in the day. But yeah, you can totally track it. And one of the cool things, and I haven't, I, I mean, in fairness, I haven't dug into it this far because I've just really started playing around with this. You get to see, like, there's logging. Like, when you start working in the cloud services, whether it's AWS or Azure or whatever, one of the things, and we're all guilty of it as developers, logging's like the last thing you put in half the time, right? It, it, it happens when it gets out to a customer and they're like, this isn't working. You're like, oh crap. Uh, let me put some logs in so that I can see what's going on. Typically, all that stuff is sort of built in for you. So you can see when things are running, how things are airing. Like you can see a whole flow of things throughout when you're using the services. Again, they can get expensive, but I've found like with the functions, it's like the best of both worlds, right? Anybody else? Anything? <laughs> you you chose a small topic. <laughs> <laughs> So I would say, and man, there's, the thing is, go Google it and you're going to find 5 million different arguments to all of it, right? I would say if you are going to go the route of microservices or nanoservices or whatever you have, like however far you want to break it down, you need to realize it all comes at a cost, right? You don't write something to scale that isn't going to require a lot of extra code because you have to check a lot of things. Like I said, when you build these things, you have to build defensively. You have to check to say, hey, did this order already get processed? I need to make sure I don't process it again, even though it came in again. So that's one, right? Like, just know that you're going to incur a lot of extra code and a lot of things that you need to check on. The second is you really need to get comfortable using either queues or event buses or service buses or something like that, because that's really how you want to communicate because you want things to be able to go get them and, and guarantee at least run once type things, right? Like hitting databases directly 
is probably not the best way to go if you're going to start walking down that microservices path. So those are probably like the small little things that I'd say. And also know it takes a lot more design time, right? If, if, you're not, if you're not refactoring something that you already know, you already have the domain knowledge of, if you're starting from the ground up, you're probably going to make a lot of mistakes and you're also going to be refactoring a lot as you go. So just know that going down that route, while it enables scale, it also introduces a ton of problems, right? Things that don't spin up, servers that die, uh, requests that don't get fully processed, that kind of thing. So it's, it's not an easy problem. So anybody else? No? Good. All right. Excellent. Yeah, Thank yeah. you.